So welcome back everybody and here we are at episode five. Hello Father, how are you? Good day Christine, good day. I'm well, I'm well thank God and a warm welcome to all our listeners and, and viewers again. Yeah, absolutely. So today we're going to be going through um, general audience number five and general audience number six. Again, I'll just show the text for anyone who's new and unfamiliar with what we're referring to. It's Man and Woman, He Created Them, A Theology of the Body by John Paul II. Um, so if you haven't already got a copy, do get one for Christmas and then you'll be able to read along with us and understand more deeply what it is that we are talking about. Um, but before we get started today, Father, will you start us with a prayer? Yes, lovely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you, and we praise you, and we bless you. We thank you for the beautiful gift of our Catholic faith. We ask uh, for a continued openness and a receptivity to the teaching of St. John Paul II. We ask for a, a fidelity and an obedience uh, to God's holy will in our lives uh, to grow in union and intimacy with the Blessed Trinity. We ask for a renewed appreciation of the human person, the human body, uh, that dignity and that beauty. We ask always for the intercession of Mary, our Blessed Mother, and Saint Joseph, our beloved patron, and of course, Saint John Paul the Great himself. We make these and all our prayers through the same, our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Um, so I thought that um, before we actually dive into General Audience 5 today, it might be worth just setting out um, as clearly as possible why it is that we need to understand the purpose of these original experiences and why it's so relevant to us today. Because it can seem that all this talk about Genesis is very ancient um, and unrelatable to our contemporary world and our contemporary lives. And so I just want to start by explaining why these original experiences are as relevant today and as fresh today as they were when they were first written. Um, and I think one of the problems is, as we've discussed before, um, if I use an example, if you are given an object, some kind of an object, and you don't know what it is, and you don't know what it's for, then the chances are you're not gonna know how to interact with that object to make it flourish, to make it work, to make it function. And you might actually uh, engage in actions that could cause damage to that object without even realizing it. And if we apply that analogy to the human person, the same can be said. If we don't understand who and what the human person is and what the purpose of the human person is, then how on earth do we determine what actions will help the human person to flourish and what actions can do harm to the human person. And it's the exploration of all these original experiences where John Paul II is building up for us, if you like, these fundamental truths of what it means to be a human person. And once he's constructed this anthropology, we are then in a position with those foundation stones in place to make a determination as to which, which actions help us to flourish and be happy and are good for us, and which actions we need to avoid because they will do us harm and will not enable us to flourish in the way that God wants us to. So that's the real reason that we need to focus in on these original experiences. So although they might appear to be ancient, they're as relevant to each one of us today as they were when they were first written, because they're the universal truths of every human person. So today we're looking at general audience five and six, and General Audience 5 opens with the title, The Meaning of Original Solitude. And then it refers to a twofold context. So the first question then, I guess, is what is original solitude and where do we find it in Genesis? And as we said last time, Father, we're talking about these original experiences that were 
the experiences that existed before the advent of original sin. So it was man and woman in the state of pure innocence. And so when it comes to original solitude, we find this in Genesis 2.18, where it says, it is not good that the man should be alone. I want to make him a helper similar to himself. And it's fair to say that a cursory reading of that sentence might lead one to conclude that original solitude is merely the existence of man without, at this point in time, the existence of woman, and that it's merely a case of him being in this moment of solitude before he's presented with his wife. But in fact, John Paul II is quite quick to point out and highlight to us something that we might miss. He points out that this notion of it not being good to be alone is actually stated prior to the distinction of the sexes into male and female. And the reason that that is relevant is that it means that the words, it's not good to be alone, applies to the whole nation of mankind, to all man and all woman. Um, it's a phrase that refers to all of us as a deep and original experience, which comes from our human nature, our shared human nature. So John Paul II goes on to explain that original solitude has in effect two meanings. One that is indeed derived from sexual difference, from the absence of woman at the time that man was created. But also he talks about the anthropological fact that it's not good to be alone having an existential sense, which is this sense that it belongs even more uh, to each individual human person than it does to mere absence of man or absence of woman. And that's not the extent of original solitude. John Paul II goes much further with this experience and he moves on to talk to us about the tasks that God gives to man that we hear about in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Um, he says that the creation of man is linked with these specific tasks. We hear that man is asked to till the ground. He's asked to subdue the earth. Um, he's asked to be fruitful and multiply and to rule over the earth. And he's also tasked with naming the animals. So what we see in this moment of this original solitude is that man um, is aware very gradually of his ability to receive and undertake these tasks that are given to him by God. He comes to see in doing these tasks in and through his body, that he is different to the animals, that he's not just another animal or thing amidst this new creation, that God has given him specific abilities, tasks, capabilities, to undertake these actions for God and respond to God's command. So God doesn't give those same capacities to the rhinos and the crocodiles. They're not tasked with naming the animals. It's only man who has the skill to be able to undertake these tasks. And John Paul II says in this process of original solitude, it's this undertaking of the tasks that gives man this beginning of his anthropological self-understanding where he comes to appreciate that although he is part of creation and that he has a relationship with the animal kingdom, he is the only creature who has the capacity for a relationship with God, that he can relate to God in a way that the animal kingdom cannot. And this is a moment in original solitude of self-awareness, of self-understanding, of um, a birthing, if you like, of his self-consciousness, that he comes to understand his differentiation from the animal kingdom. And so John Paul II says that original solitude has both a positive and a negative dimension. So on the negative dimension, we hear that it's not good for man to be alone. And we see that man in creation, as the only human person at that time, um, comes to recognize everything that he is not, that he is not a plant, that he is not mere soil or mere matter, that he's not an animal. So that's what's negative for him. He, he identifies all the things that he is not. But in the positive dimension of original solitude, 
it's this notion that he appreciates that he is some way different, that he has some dignity that is not shared amidst the animal kingdom. And it's that dignity of being able to have a relationship with God, that he is created not as mere matter, not as a mere animal, but he has been created as a person capable of personal relationship. And so um, this is where um, we see man in Genesis 1 and 2 almost being prepared in effect for the moment when he will receive into his company another human person when he's ultimately presented with Eve. So it's in this moment of original solitude where we're seeing this self-understanding and this self-consciousness um, of man coming to light, him coming to understand who he is as a human person and not a mere animal. Father, do you want to add anything into that? No, I think that's really that's really comprehensive, Christine. You know, um, it's it's a wonderful summary <clears throat> of um, you know a complex reality, if you like. Um, so yeah, original solitude. I mean, there's um, what I could add is. Um, <clears throat> There's a wonderful uh, short summary from the catechism um, that really explains, you know, further uh, the the state, if you like, of original solitude. And so it's from paragraph 357, paragraph 357, and it says, being in the image of God, the human individual possesses the dignity of a person who is not just something, but someone. I guess we could add somebody, you know, a body. It's all, you know, manifested through the body, all this wonderful uh, state of original solitude. He is capable of self-knowledge, of self-possession, and of freely giving himself and entering into communion with other persons so that wonderful gift as you said of self-determination you know so the human person man and woman is the only being able to disobey god um and therefore love freely you know so we have that uh, wonderful gift of free will you know that god uh, endowed us each with and he is called by grace to a covenant with his creator to offer him a response of faith and love that no other creature can give in his stead. So that, I think, is a beautiful um, summary of the, the being, you know, that, that God has created, that we're, we're able to enter into communion with God. I mean, that's an extraordinary gift, you know, to really meditate on and contemplate on and then I guess all I could you know further add is that I think the the real gift of this teaching as we've said uh, previously um is that it really offers a powerful antidote to the, the trials and tribulations of our present culture and indeed the church and so even the idea of an identity, a personal identity is very challenging for a lot of people, as we've said. People, we don't even know now what it means to be a man or a woman, you know. So how are we able to even construct a communion of persons in marriage, you know, if that fundamental uh, building block isn't there? And so some of these powerful teachings, I think, help us to um to mentor uh even young people you know into a sense of identity um so that they're able to make a gift and so i think it's um gaudium at spes 24 you know that um i think john paul ii had a big hand in that man only truly finds himself by making a gift of self and so there's a big couple of pieces there in terms of someone's identity <coughs> excuse me in order to give himself to the other 
a person must be in possession of a self. And so these are these are big, deep co uh, concepts. If we don't really know who we are as a man or who we are as a woman, it's very difficult to construct that identity, that sense of self, that cohesive um, sense of someone in possession of a self. And that, I think, is a necessary foundation in order to build a sense of communion, like we'll see a bit later on in original unity. So these are huge pieces, I think, huge pieces for our culture. Um, and I think John Paul II can help us uh, to really ponder and reflect on what it means to be a man uh, and a woman in the world, different from the animals, in certain sense, that existential solitude with God, as you said, and yet this extraordinary capacity that the animals don't share, this extraordinary capacity to determine ourselves, um, you know, what we do in terms of our work, who we love, you know, in terms of our will, and then this extraordinary uh, gift of being able to enter into communion uh, with God, you know, through our human bodies and the difference in which we do that as male and female. So it's very rich and very dense and, um, you know, it merits uh, deeper reflection always, I think. Yeah, it does, absolutely. And it does give us, as the more we progress through and the more we go deeper into us, into this, sorry, I think people will begin to appreciate how we are building up these essential and perennial truths of the human person that then give us such a firm foundation for then embarking into um, discussions with friends and colleagues on all the ethical issues that um, particularly those who don't understand the teaching of the Catholic Church find so challenging. Yeah. But um, certainly if people to journey with us on this they'll eventually be equipped with what they need to engage with all these questions these hot topic um situations that we find we have today um yeah. just moving on then to audience six i just wanted to give a little bit of explanation about this notion of subjectivity there's there's a lot of language that john paul ii uses um you know, we've talked the other week about metaphysics. Today, we've got ontology, subjectivity. And I just think it's worth just explaining those uh, concepts a little bit, just in case people are finding them a little bit opaque in the way that he's using them. Um, so as I say, you know, we're building up these truths of the human person. That's what theology of the body is all about, giving us these perennial truths of the human person. And in audience six, we see John Paul II use this term subjectivity, um, and again, we're in these realms of the philosophical and the metaphysical language. But in simple terms, when he's using this term subjectivity, he's referring to discussions concerning a sentient being, beings, in other words, like ourselves, beings with consciousness, beings with agency, self-determination, able to choose and make choices to weigh up good and evil, um, and to do with the mind. So subjectivity is all to do with the kind of capacities that the human person has. Um, and then I just made a note here that in relation to Genesis and um, through this notion of original solitude and man coming to this conscious awarenessness of his consciousness, um, his ability to think, his ability to reflect, his ability to act, to reason, to choose, to use his will as he sees fit. In other words, he comes to appreciate that he doesn't act like the animals act on mere impulse or instinct, but he can act in a rational and reasoned manner. And John Paul II says this about it. He says, the concept of original solitude includes both self-consciousness and self-determination. The fact that man is alone contains within itself this ontological structure, ontological meaning the nature of being, what it is to be, what it is to exist. So he's saying that original solitude is revealing to man that he has these capacities over and above what the animal kingdom has. And this is what makes up his nature as a human person. 
So the experience of original solitude is opening up to man the truths of his being, the truths of his ontology. Um, and I've just got one final quote here where it says, John Paul II says, man is alone, that is to say through his own humanity, through what he is. He is at the same time set in a unique, exclusive and unrepeatable relationship with God. And this is where we see the, the indications of man's dignity before God over and above that of the animal kingdom. Yeah. Yes, Christine, that's powerful, powerful, beautiful teaching. You know, it's, it's again, it's a wonderful summary. And um, just one thing, you know, that, that comes to my mind, you know, we're both, I guess, uh, doing our best not to shy away from these hot button topics, you know, and uh, just as you're talking there, I'm reflecting on the present crisis, you know, in, in this gender dysphoria and how people are, young people often are claiming to be animals, you know, it's quite an extraordinary uh, mm. phenomenon, like a tragic situation, really. And so, you know, Genesis the text of Genesis and John Paul II's, uh, you know, profound commentary on that is clearly stating that, you know, man named the animals has dominion over them and his body clearly is nowhere like, nothing like their bodies, you know, the animals and this extraordinary capacity, as we say, of self-determination, you know, this self-consciousness, uh, this existential loneliness, and so, you know, without laboring the point, just again to to speak into that present cultural crisis that, you know, male and female are created with these beautiful bodies, you know, these beautiful bodies, which is why the artists, you know, down through the centuries have been so fascinated, you know, particularly with the, the beauty of the woman's body through art and you know literature and um and now tragically extraordinarily degraded through pornography you know but the the basic truth is still there the beauty of the human body and so just again um acknowledging this crisis this anthropological crisis that we're in in our present culture and again to have compassion you know on our young people particularly and to help them see that no, no, God has given them a beautiful body um, as male and female. And this is, you know, this is how we construct um, a beautiful identity in order to be able to make a gift of ourselves. You know, there's such beautiful fundamental teachings here that have become eroded and confused in our present culture. So stick with us on this um, exciting journey of discovery, eh, Christine? Yeah, uh, just as you were you saying know. that, I was just thinking if only this was the foundational teaching in every Catholic school, well, in every school full stop, but we Absolutely. can at least start with Catholic schools, where we can actually clarify identity and clarify the dignity of the human person, male and female. Uh, yeah, I mean, it would be fantastic. So, yeah, any teachers in particular that are listening, do please stick with us because I'm sure you'll find it helpful. Yes. Okay, was there anything else that you wanted to add into this episode? No, Christine, that is, um, that is great. Yeah, that is great. I'm really enjoying, I'm really enjoying this journey. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm excited, you know, to, 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 to d delve in deeper always and to, uh, you know, to try and present it as clearly as we can, this beautiful teaching. So, you know, it is I, exciting. I, I, yeah, it is really exciting. There's so much more to come. We're only literally just on the surface, aren't we, Father? We've got so much more yeah, to do. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, we'll leave it there. So thank you very much, Father, and thank, thank you, you to everyone for watching. God bless you. We'll see, see you, you next time. time. <laughs> Audience seven and eight in our next episode. Thank you. God, God bless. bless. God bless everyone.